Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, très, très, très heureuse de, de vous voir tous aujourd'hui ici. Ça va être une formidable conférence donnée par quelqu'un que Joël Doré et moi, on apprécie beaucoup, beaucoup, qui s'appelle Félicité Jaka, que ceux qui connaissent la littérature sur la psychiatrie nutritionnelle connaissent peut-être bien. Elle est professeure de psychiatrie nutritionnelle en, en Australie, à l'université de, de Deakin, pas très loin de de Melbourne, et elle est directeur d'un centre qui s'appelle Food and Mood, donc alimentation et humeur, et elle est la créatrice et la présidente de la Société internationale pour la psychiatrie nutritionnelle, qui est un domaine qu'elle a en fait créé et lancé avec un papier Princeps qu'elle a publié dans Lancet il y a un certain nombre d'années. Peut-être que je vais laisser Joël Doré euh, se, se présenter, je pense que vous le connaissez tous, puisqu'il est venu vous présenter le projet French Gut à plusieurs reprises on est en très généreux de son temps. Joël Oui, merci beaucoup Marion. Merci de cette opportunité que, qui m'est offerte de, euh, de faire un petit peu le, ah, le, le pendant, donner la parole à, à Félicie. Good to have you with us. Uh, Marion just introduced you before, and I was uh, just going to say that uh, I'm really honored and pleased to, uh, to uh, chair uh, the, the presentation. Um, I'm a research director with INRAE. Uh, in France, and uh, really I've dealt all my career on the microbiome. And uh, in the recent uh, past, actually over the past 10, 15 years, uh, led to, uh, to work on the gut-brain axis a little bit. Uh, now, um, just to add one word from what Marion was uh, saying, she explained who, who you are, Felice. I'll just say that you are uh, among the highly cited re researchers uh, on the top 0.1% of scientists worldwide. And your ongoing research focuses particularly on diet and nutrition as risk factors and treatment targets for mental health and disorders. Um, so again, I'm very proud to, uh, to be here with you. And I'll pass you the word if you can put up your, uh, your slides uh, for your presentation on nutritional psychiatry and the microbiota gut brain axis. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll set the scene, I'll give you a, a sort of a I guess, an overview of nutritional psychiatry. It'll be a very brief overview, but it'll give you an overview of the main studies, the findings, where we're sitting, where the translation is at with nutritional psychiatry. But then I'll then go into the work that we're doing now and, and how this fits with the, gut, the microbiota gut-brain axis. And hopefully we'll have some time for questions when I finish. So uh, I'll start off. These are just my uh, declarations of interest. Um, so there's two main contexts for nutritional psychiatry. First is that of mental disorders as a leading cause of global disability. And here we're drawing on the Global Burden of Disease study, uh, many years in a row showing that mental disorders are a, a, a key cause of uh, global disability. But at the same time, poor diet and its sequelae, including you know, high blood glucose, high body weight, high blood pressure, the leading cause of illness and early death around the world. The um, cost of the industrialized food system to global health and the environment is upwards of $12 trillion a year. Um, and of course, despite this, we have no effective food policies anywhere in the world that have been successful in mitigating the activities of the industrialized uh, food system. Now, nutritional psychiatry really sits at this convergence between mental disorders and diet. And that means it's sitting at the, the convergence of the two leading causes of disease burden globally. When we think about mental disorders, of course, many of the risk factors are very difficult to modify. So genetics, um, early life trauma, life stress, poverty and disadvantage. These are all things that are difficult to modify. So identifying risk factors that are modifiable is really important. Identifying risk factors that have very, very broad population exposure is the other imperative. And of course, diet is something that affects 100% of the population several times every day. So understanding that these two things are, are, are linked gives us really important new opportunities for both prevention and also for, treat, for treatment. So when we think about this field of nutritional psychiatry and nutritional psychiatry research, it's really just only uh, just over a decade old. It's a very relatively speaking new field. Um, and 
as a result, most of the research has, but certainly not all, has been observational in nature and uh, coming from animal studies. And, but what we do have to date over this last 12 years is now a very, very comprehensive body of evidence from right across the globe, from across cultures, across countries, across cultures, and across the lifespan that tells us that people who eat a healthier diet are less likely to have or develop depression in particular. And again, because of the recency of the field, most of the research to date has focused on the common mental disorders, depression and anxiety. Now, when we think about this link between diet quality and common mental disorders and depression, of course, we immediately think, okay, so this must be potentially explained by other variables that are common to both. So things such as socioeconomic status, you know, education and income, these are big factors that are linked to both diet quality, mental disorder um, and, and prevalence and risk. Things like um, body weight, other health behaviours, these are all potential explanatory variables in this association. However, the very, very extensive number of studies have looked at this in quite uh, a lot of detail, and these factors do not explain the relationships that we consistently see. Moreover, reverse causality, where people are changing their dietary behaviours because of their mental health, is not the explanation for the relationships that we see. And there are many, many prospective studies. And here's just one as an example. This is, sorry, this is one that uh, I was involved in in molecular psychiatry in 2018. So it's a systematic literature and meta-analysis. There's, there's quite a number of these now. And this looks at diet quality measured in different ways. There's many different ways in which you can assess whole of diet um, and looks at the risk for depression in these prospective studies. And over and over again, we see that um, roughly speaking, there's about a 30% reduction in risk for incident depression in people who have a healthier diet. Um, really importantly, again, thinking about prevention, this is true right across the age range. So this is particularly important when we recognize that half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. So again, what are factors we can modify that might, um, influence risk and maybe prevent some uh, cases occurring. And in this like, it's really notice, uh, notable that there are many, many studies that have looked at this in um, adolescents, young adolescents from many different um, uh, countries. These are just some of the, the, the studies that I've led. Um, now, when we look, we see consistently, again, similar to the adult literature, that both too much of the uh, ultra processed foods and or not enough of the healthful foods that are full of fiber and polyphenols, et cetera, are associated with um, worse mood outcomes. And this is again, independent of a whole lot of family factors, chaotic family environments, poor family management, um, high conflict situations, family SES. These things don't explain the relationships that we see. This last reference is a systematic literature review. It's quite old now and needs updating. But if we go back even further, we see this link. So this is a study I led um, in 2013. It was the first study to actually look at the, the sort of the Barker hypothesis, which talks about early life nutrition as an important risk factor for health outcomes in children and extend it to mental health. So we looked at data from more than 23,000 mothers and their children. We looked at mother's diet during pregnancy, children's diet in the first few years, and modeled the trajectory of internalizing and externalizing over the first few years of life as a function of dietary exposures in pregnancy and early life. And we see the expected associations that we see in other age groups. Um, this, this is a nice meta-analysis from colleagues of ours in, in Norway, bringing together all the data uh, up to 2016, showing again that the, the data tell us that there is this link between the quality of mother's diets during pregnancy and the um, socio and emotional cognitive outcomes in children. Now, these are not huge effect sizes. You know, you don't want people thinking, oh, my goodness, I ate junk food during my pregnancy. My child is going to have a, a terrible outcome. 
These are small effect sizes, but they are consistent. And again, with a, an exposure that affects 100% of the population that is modifiable, we need to be really looking at this in more detail. And in fact, with these um, authors in Norway, we've just published a paper last year looking at um, ADHD uh, symptoms and diagnoses as a function of both mother's diet and children's diet, and again, seeing these links. So this is an important understanding. But again, this is all coming from the observational literature. We also see these links at the other end of life. And we've generated, we, we did the first study to show that the, the, the animal data that tells us that if you manipulate diet, you have an impact on the hippocampus, the proteins that give rise to neurogenesis um, and uh, hippocampal dependent uh, memory and behavior. Um, we saw this in humans as well, such that diet quality uh, was not only linked to hippocampal volume in older people, but it was actually quite a large effect size. And that's now been shown in two other much larger cohort studies. But of course, correlation doesn't equal causation. We need to move to randomized control trials. Very challenging doing dietary trials. You can't blind people with just one example of the many different channel challenges. This is our SMILES trial, which has had an outsized impact on the field of psychiatry, despite it being a very small study. Um, and it wasn't designed to be a small study, but it was very, very difficult to recruit for. And I think that part of that is that no one really believed that diet could affect change in a serious mental disorder. But nonetheless, what we did was we recruited people with moderate to severe clinical depression, major depressive disorder. They were randomly assigned to receive either nutritional support from a clinical dietitian or social support using a befriending protocol. And this was adjunctive. Um, of course, most people were on uh, other forms of treatment. We were only able to recruit 67 people. Uh, we aimed for more than twice that and um, failed to re uh, achieve our recruitment targets in three years. So we did not expect to see a difference between the groups, but what we saw was a very large difference such that those in the dietary intervention, approximately third of them went on to have a full remission of their clinical depression. And again, these were quite sick people. Um, we saw that there was a very close knit relationship between the degree to which people improved their diet and the degree to which their depression symptoms improved. And, you know, people were able to improve their diet. We see this over and over again. People with mental disorders, given support, are able to make improvements to their diet and they like the fact that this is something that's under their control, something that they can do for themselves, and they're very willing to do it. The diet we were advocating was designed to be simple and achievable and affordable and accessible. So things like tinned, uh, tinned legumes and um, beans, these are chickpeas, tinned fish, frozen vegetables, things that were very, very easy to uh, prepare and affordable. People believe that a healthy diet needs to be expensive. We did a very detailed cost analysis that was published and we showed that our diet was actually cheaper than the unhealthy diet that people were eating when they came into the study. We also did a detailed economic evaluation and we showed that there was an approximate two and a half thousand dollar Australian dollar cost saving for people within the dietary intervention group because they lost less time out of role. They saw other health professionals less often. So it's suggesting that this had a, a benefit that extended beyond just their mental health. Um, now, there's only been a handful of trials. There's been four trials to date that have been run in people with depression. The results of those trials have been very consistent with what we saw in the SMILES trial. But um, when we look at the data, and we know that there are many other trials underway at the moment, so we will be getting more data in hopefully the not too distant future. But what we did do, and this we published in 2019, was a meta-analysis where we looked at all of the studies where there'd been a dietary intervention targeting whole of diet, so not just a, you know, a, a single food or you know, supplements or anything like that, where depression and anxiety were not the primary target or outcome, but they did measure depression and or anxiety. And what we see when we look at those data 
and this is 16 randomized controlled trials, more than 45,000 participants, we see that there is an improvement in diet uh, in depressive symptoms linked to improvements in diet quality. We saw less of an effect for anxiety, but there were far fewer studies. When a, when a nutrition professional was employed to deliver the intervention, then we did see changes in anxiety. So this is important. It's not um, nearly as effective to deliver a dietary intervention if you are a psychologist or a research assistant, whereas a dietitian or nutritionist can get these very good outcomes. So, uh, you know, more recently, we can say that diet matters to mental health and it's modifiable. Therefore, it's a really important target for prevention and treatment. And what I haven't done here is mention all of the animal studies, and there's a lot more data out there, but this is just to, to make it, you know, uh, simple and accessible. We have quite a lot of traction now in the policy space. And remember, again, this is a, this is a research field that is only just over a decade old. Our work has been published, uh, cited in more than 80 policy documents around the world, including United Nations, WHO, UNICEF, et cetera, uh, and country level policies. And this is a really good example. This was our National Productivity Commission mental health report. For the first time, 2020 lists poor nutrition, along with physical activity, inadequate sleep, substance use, as risk factors and treatment targets for mental disorders. So this is a big shift. An even larger shift is our updated um, clinical guidelines for mood disorders, clinical practice guidelines from the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists has for the first time anywhere in the world, lifestyle medicine essentially as the foundation of treatment. So achieving a healthy diet, regular exercise, sleep, substance cessation and, um, uh, and, and they're calling it foundational and essentially non-negotiable. So then you move on to other forms of treatment and support. This is a really large shift as you would imagine, but of course there's also very large translation gap because medical practitioners, psychiatrists, they do not receive any nutrition training or very, very little. We're starting to address that. So we set up a free online course, this course, Food and Mood. We ran it first at the end of 2019 and we've run a few times since then. It's already enrolled more than 75,000 students from more than 170 countries, which really tells us about the interest in this particular topic, um, not just from scientists and clinicians, but also the public. Uh, but we're also working with the RANZCP to de design accredited training for psychiatrists. We will do that for dietitians, for general practitioners, and hopefully psychologists as well. And that will happen over the next couple of years. We're doing quite a bit of the training and education. We set up an international task force with the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry in 2019 to develop um, clinical guidelines for lifestyle medicine in mental health treatment. The first of those focused on depression will be published this year. It's very close to submission. You will recognize some of the faces here. Uh, my co-director, Professor Adrian O'Neill is co-chair and Dr. Wolf Marks in my team is leading the writing. And these are some of the, the key people on the task force. Uh, so... So the Food and Mood Centre is unique in the world. It's the only research centre in the world. I'm hoping, uh, apparently my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, it's the only research centre in the world focused on nutritional psychiatry research. I'm the president of the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research as well. So we're really sort of, I guess, own this space in that we're leading leading the charge, leading the push to sort of establish the evidence base and to, to promote it. The work that we do at the Food and Mood Centre is broad. It spans the life um, range from early life right through to ageing. It encompasses physical health, mental and brain health, health behaviours and determinants, including social determinants. Um, we look at population health, clinical interventions, including efficacy and effectiveness trials 
mechanisms, implementation science, and as I said, education and training. One of the areas that we're particularly focused on, and this is a focus of this talk, is um, biological mechanisms of action. So this is a big review that we developed and published in 2020 in molecular psychiatry, where we brought together many of the world's leading experts to really focus on the, all the different pathways by which diet might influence mental and brain health. And you can see here that um, these are multitudes. Here we have neurogenesis, so BDNF, hippocampal volume, brain plasticity, inflammation and oxidative stress, of course, mitochondrial dysfunction, the tryptophan kynurenine pathways, stress response system, epigenetics. But really the gut microbiome sitting down here, it, it kind of links all of these, you know, the gut microbiota influences all these pathways for, to one extent or another, obviously inflammation in the immune system, particularly uh, the stress response system also particularly, but it's involved in all of these. And we also know that diet can modify the gut microbiome very quickly. And so when we think about all the factors influencing the gut microbiome, both the composition and the function, diet, of course, is a very large player. So this is where our interest lies because it's something that's measurable, it's very modifiable, it's very concrete to explain to people, it makes it much easier to explain why people might want to eat a healthier diet rather than just saying it's healthy or they don't want to have a heart attack or something. It's much more concrete. <coughs> So we have a very extensive microbiome research program. Dr. Amy Lofman is our methodological lead, uh, but we have bioinformaticians and a range of different students and postdocs working in this now. Um, we uh, focus on the infant microbiome and neurodevelopment, oral microbiome and brain health. And I'll talk about all of these clinical trials and epidemiology. We have roughly 20 different studies underway at the Food and Mood Center at the moment, and the large majority of these are collecting microbiome data. We also have a big focus on methods and, and ensuring gold standards. Um, and we also set up the Australasian Human Microbiome Research Network, which is um, very busy and very active. Now, because of COVID <laughs> and because our Food and Mood Centre is only relatively young, uh, it was only set up in 2017, myself and two PhD students, and we are now in that time between 2017 and now, even with the global pandemic, we've gone from myself and two students to 50 people. We've just added another three in the last week. So we're, we're growing very, very rapidly. But many studies were put on hold because of COVID. And um, that's the same for research centers across the world. And this means that I have few data to present because many of our studies are actually underway as we speak, but we do have some data. And these, this is a really important, very large systematic literature review that we published um, only in the last couple of months in molecular psychiatry. It's the largest to date. We wanted to see whether there were um, differences between people with and without major psychiatric disorders. So depressive disorder, bipolar and schizophrenia. And then whether if there are differences seen between those with and without mental disorders, whether there are commonalities in across the disorders in gut microbiome differences and particularly whether these can be linked to pathogenesis. Because of course, in psychiatry, we lack biomarkers for, for diagnosis, for prognosis, for targeting. And these biomarkers are the holy grail in psychiatry. So this is this, what we set out to actually look at. And what we saw, and we're again being quite brief, but we didn't see evidence um, of differences in alpha diversity between those with and without a mental disorder. And alpha diversity is a measure of sort of, you know, how many bacteria and um, it, it's often used as a shorthand for the healthiness of the, of the gut, but the data are a bit equivocal about that. But what we did see pretty consistently is that there were differences between people with a mental disorder and without a mental disorder. 
And we, when we look specifically at different taxa, what we saw was consistently across depression, bipolar and schizophrenia, we saw increased uh, presence of or increased abundance of lactic acid producing bacteria and GABA producing bacteria and reduced butyrate production, uh, butyrate producing bacteria or bacteria that have the, the functional potential to produce butyrate which is anti-inflammatory. It's really important short chain fatty acid produced by the microbiota that influences immune function. And of course, we know that the immune system is very closely involved with uh, mental disorders in a bi-directional way. And GABA, uh, of course, is in, in, we see this in, in mental disorders. This is very interesting though, because lactobacillus is often, well, it's considered a probiotic as in it has health properties, but we also know that people with mental disorders very often have elevated lactate and lactic acid. And so we don't actually understand why this is the case, but the fact that it was consistently observed across the disorders, I think is starting to point to some mechanistic pathways that can be further interrogated. We've done quite a bit of work looking at the early life microbiota. We know that the early life infant microbiota helps to train the immune system, very important in looking at allergic and, and autoimmune disease outcomes. But we're also starting to glean that it may well be very important in brain development as well, both in utero and in the first um, is, you know, days, weeks, months of life. So what we want to know with our public health hat on is, is modification of the pregnancy diet to change the early life gut microbiota a potential strategy for improving child mental health outcomes? So you've got mother's diet during pregnancy, which influences mother's mental health and is linked to child mental health, but it also influences both mother and child's microbiome and potentially the child, the infant's brain development in utero. Uh, this is that link here. And then of course, the child's microbiota in the first days, weeks, months of life. And then these um, you know, mental and cognitive health outcomes. So these are just some of the data uh, that are published. This was published uh, in eBiomedicine led by Dr. Sam Dawson, who's a postdoc in my team and bioinformatician and nutritionist. So we, this is a large cohort study of, um, well, it's not large, but it, is, it has a lot of depth. So it's more than a thousand mothers and their infants. And what she looked at was the mother's uh, microbiota and diet, and then the child um, uh, internalizing and externalizing. And what she saw was that higher prenatal alpha diversity was associated with reduced likelihood of problem behaviors. So elevated internalizing and externalizing behaviors in the offspring. And the alpha diversity was linked to a healthy dietary pattern. So what we had here was there was no direct effect in this case, and this is probably a statistical power issue, between the mother's diet during pregnancy and the child's emotional behaviors but there was an indirect effect. Mother's diets were linked to, healthier diets were linked to more diverse microbiota and more diverse microbiota were linked to uh, better internalizing, externalizing behavior levels. We also, um, Dr. Amy Lofman in our team led a study, another study from the Barwin Infant Study, the same cohort study, where she looked at the microbiome profiles of infants at one and six months and 12 months and looked again at child internalizing, externalizing with due consideration of all these potential confounders and saw no links between the microbiota at one and six months with child later emotional development, but did see that at one one year, the presence or absence of a particular Prevotella bacteria species, the Prevotella copri, was linked to um, emotional behavioural problems. So kids who uh, had problems were far less likely to have this Prevotella. Prevotella in turn is linked to, to fibre intake. So there's this other um, indirect link there. So what we did was we designed a intervention, a small intervention study, 
randomized controlled trial of pregnant women. Women were recruited during pregnancy and randomly assigned to get either treatment as normal or a gut focused dietary intervention. This dietary intervention did improve prenatal diet. People, uh, the women ate a better diet quality, more variety and more prebiotic fiber filled foods, as well as uh, more fermented foods. And what we saw uh, was that um, the infants, so that the infant microbiome was the primary outcome. And intriguingly, and really we can only consider this a pilot because it's only got 45 women, but uh, there were no differences in these really important um, uh, variables, uh, gestational age, cesarean, breastfed, but there was differences in alpha diversity in the infants. So those who were in the, the mothers had their dietary intervention, a healthier diet, they had lower alpha diversity than those whose mothers didn't receive that intervention. Um, there was a change in maternal prevotella, again, linked to dietary um, improvement in the mothers and differences in different uh, OTUs in the children. Now, I won't go into detail, they're not yet published, and so we won't share these widely, uh, but we're still trying to understand these. But the fact that there was a difference suggests that you can modify mother's diets during pregnancy and affect changes in the infant microbiome, which is potentially really important. Now we've got a whole host of other studies happening in the microbiome space at the moment, and I'm only going to touch on a few of them. Um, just looking again at the time, or oh, we've got a bit of time actually, great. So this is a pilot study of fecal microbial transplant for people with major depressive disorder. We know of course that there is this microbiome gut brain axis. We know that potentially one of the quickest ways to change someone's microbiome is by giving them a fecal transplant, a stool transplant. Um, this has been, we, we did a systematic literature review. We've looked at all of the data. FMT is very safe and it is a almost first line treatment for C. difficile, which is a really nasty um, bowel condition that arises from uh, too many antibiotics and can be potentially fatal. It's increasingly being trialled in inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, Dr. Valerie or Professor Valerie Taylor in, in Canada um, has recently completed, and we don't know what the results are yet, a, pilot, a study in bipolar disorder. So this is a feasibility study in major depressive disorder. Feasibility because people at this stage have to come in and have four days in a row of enemas. And so one way of having an FMT in the most common is to have a colonoscopy, but that's intrusive. It involves hospitals, it's expensive, um, uh, you know, anesthetic, all of these things. So this is something that theoretically can be delivered in a, in a doctor's surgery. So they're um, enemas delivered four days in a row. Adults, again, with moderate to severe major depressive disorder, only 15. And so feasibility is our primary outcome. But we will be looking at all of these secondary factors as outcomes as well. And this will hopefully set the scene for a far larger properly powered trial in, in uh, major depressive disorder. We're also just about to start an a interesting study of fermented dairy versus a placebo fermented dairy in 40 women, where we'll be using MRI and mass spec to look at um, a whole host of brain imaging endpoints, uh, neurotransmitters, brain metabolites, uh, blood biomarkers, inflammation and oxidative stress, uh, BDNF, um, cognitive outcomes, cognitive performance, depression and anxiety, and um, we'll do shotgun sequencing on the gut microbiota as well. So that will be really interesting because there are some really very interesting pilot data uh, suggesting that fermented foods for many reasons can have an impact on the brain and the emotional regions of the brain. So we want to extend that existing literature and look at this more um, comprehensively. This is another study where we're looking um, not in patients with a mental disorder, but people living with obesity, looking, comparing the effect of a low energy diet, a very low energy diet that's based on whole foods compared to one that's based on very, very processed foods. So these would be like those, those weight loss shakes and uh, bars that people eat. 
compared to real food with beans and vegetables and things like that. And the primary outcome is the metagenomic profiles of the gut microbiota, but we'll also be looking at a um, range of other outcomes. So this is really testing the hypothesis that there will be a measurable difference on these key biomarkers of two different forms of a calorie equivalent diet. They both have the same sorts of nutritional profiles from the point of view of vitamins and minerals, energy, but they are very different in their composition. And one is very, very processed and one isn't. So this is a really interesting way to test that hypothesis. We're also doing a nice study of people with IBS and uh, anxiety and or depression. So they're very commonly uh, co-occur. And um, this is like looking at whether we can actually tackle both, but with a Mediterranean style diet. So this is being led by Dr. Heidi Stugatacre in our team, who's one of the world's leading experts on diet, the gut and IBS. Uh, she's led some of the really key trials in, in the low FODMAP diets and shown that low fat FODMAP diets have an impact on um, bifidobacteria and healthful bacterial strains that can be mitigated with um, the administration of probiotics. So this is a really useful study. But then we're also doing a very, very large international randomized controlled trial of a digital version of our SMILES trial with a proper nutrition education control condition. Um, that is also about to start. And we'll also be collecting at least 100 stool samples from participants in that study, but the whole sample size will be closer to 1,000. This is a really important study. Um, this is an effectiveness trial. So uh, for those of you who don't know, an efficacy trial is a very tightly controlled, randomised controlled trial. And an, efficacy, uh, an effectiveness trial is a real world trial where it's not tightly controlled. It's like what actually happens with real life patients in the real world. This is a non-inferiority trial. We want to know is diet and exercise support delivered by dietitians and exercise physiologists at least as effective as psychological support delivered by psychologists? So we're not looking to see whether one is better than the other, but rather whether one is as good as the other, whether it's cost effective. And the end game is not to say people would receive one or the other in the future in the real world. It's to say that this expands our treatment options for patients, depending on their, their preferences, availability, all of those sorts of things. And then this has been done at the state level. We've nearly finished this trial, roughly 185 participants of all sorts of different mental disorders because they're coming through the clinical services. We are uh, next year commencing a large national trial to build on this. Now, but from this one, we are collecting microbiome samples. So that's nearly 200 people who've had these lifestyle intervention versus psychotherapy interventions. And we'll be able to have a look at differences and tie it to um, outcomes and severity and that sort of thing. We've got a very large epidemiological study going, more than 1,200 people with very, very detailed data on, uh, in particular, um, psychiatric conditions measured by semi-structured clinical interviews um, uh, along with uh, oral and stool microbiome and blood biomarkers. We're going to be doing a lot of work with these data, trying to develop predictive algorithms for disease and risk assessment tools. Um, we are looking at the oral microbiome and Alzheimer's disease. Again, this work is being led by Dr. Amy Lothman and we're doing more work too in older people. This is a healthy brain project. Um, it involves 10,000 healthy middle-aged Australians that are being followed up over time to see who develops cognitive impairment and dementia. And then there's a biomarker sub-cohort of 200. And uh, our work will investigate microbiome differences amongst people, um, carriers of APOE4 and non-carriers, look at the microbiome signature of Alzheimer's disease and uh, look at whether changes in the microbiome or bio microbiome-related factors mediate any 
relationship we see between diet and other lifestyle factors and the risk for Alzheimer's disease and related biomarkers. So this is an interesting study that's underway as well, long-term. Now, if you want to know a bit more about this, you can read, this is a book that I published a while back now, but it gives you a sort of a good basis and grounding in nutritional psychiatry. This is a, a book that my husband and I published a couple of, or well, 18 months ago now. It's aimed at kids, but also, of course, their parents and teachers. And it, the thinking behind this is that you, we've had public health messages about the importance of healthy diet for 20 odd years, and it's made no difference. In Australia, fewer than 5% of people eat according to the dietary guidelines. Ha less than half a percent of children eat the recommended intake of vegetables and legumes. Australian teenagers eat an average of seven serves of junk food every day. If you make your public health messaging around food linked to obesity it's just pointless it's stigmatizing it doesn't work people don't respond to it and they can't lose weight or if they can they put it back on again for all sorts of complex reasons uh, if it's something to do with well eat well or one day you will have a heart attack or cancer that's too far in the future it doesn't change behavior particularly for young people if you say actually what you eat now will within hours affect the gut microbiota or for kids, the zoo in my poo. And that will translate to changes in your physical and mental health, potentially very, very quickly. This is concrete. It's immediate. And people respond and it prompts dietary behavior change. And this is what we've seen. And we want to leverage on this. So this book is really fun. It's designed for kids because they like talking about poo. Um, if you like to know more, this is our International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research. We had a fantastic conference in London at the end of 2019 um, that was incredibly well attended and, and just a wonderfully successful conference. And then we hit lockdown. And <laughs> um, so our next conference will be in Australia uh, in one year's time. So in March uh, 2023. But Dr. Wolf Marks in our team um, is leading up a very active and engaged early career researcher committee. There's a lot going on, webinars and seminars and all sorts of things. So please do go and join up if you're interested in this. This is just some of our team. We are, as I said, close to, well, more than 50 now, uh, but these are just ones that were available on a particular day for a photograph. Is uh, Professor Adrian O'Neill, who's joined me this year as co-director of the centre. So I hope you found that really interesting. Please do go to the Food and Mood Centre website if you'd like to know more. There's a lot of information and resources on there, a lot of blog posts, these sorts of things. Um, and you can look at my Google Scholar profile if you want to see more of the studies. Um, and I hope that you found that really interesting. So I'll stop sharing so we can hopefully have some time for questions. Thanks very much, Felicity. I'll, I'll, I'll take the word and say that uh, it was really fascinating presentation and very impressive altogether results and, uh, and uh, ongoing uh, research and programs and trials. So uh, thank you very, very much for, for all that. I think I'll take um, uh, a few of my long list of questions and then uh, open the discussion for other people, obviously not uh, uh, take every every time we have, every minute we have left. Uh, but the first thing I want to ask is, um, uh, you say Australia is uh, leading the push um, and it's really, it seems to me much advanced in your field of research. So I wondered whether it's a JAKA effect or uh, whether uh, you have other explanations for this in view of the uh, massive inter-countries differences that we have in management of mental disorders overall. <clears throat> uh, it, it's me. And that's not um, a boast. It's just simply to say that this has been, I guess, my passion and my uh, life's work. So I've put a huge amount of work into it over the last um, 10 to 15 years. And because of that, it's it. So I've I founded the International Society. I put together the Food and Mood Centre. Uh, I've led all of the seminal studies in the field, and that was because of personal passion. And I think that that's true in any 
area of science or change is that you will have one or one small group of people who are really, really passionate about something and that drives the change. But I'm tired now. <laughs> and so now I'm really trying to build a much bigger team and a much stronger foundation so that it's just not me trying to, to change things, but actually um, really building something. And this is where the society comes in and we now have, you know, a real growing body from right around, around the world who are working on studies, but because it's such a new field, many of those studies are still underway and of course affected by COVID. But we know that in Australia, the, the clinical guidelines, that was a really major breakthrough. We know that the, the UK government and Public Health England are looking at uh, all of the work we're doing in nutritional psychiatry and the work that others are doing all around the world and looking at how this might um, influence the NICE guidelines. We have, I think, the Canadian clinical guidelines for mood disorders also have mm -hmm. uh, certainly exercise and I think diet in there as well, just not to the same very explicit degree. So this is changing. But what we need now is more and more research. And I think these effectiveness trials where we go, okay, how do we get this into the real world? And does it work when you do it in the real world? How do you get behavior change in diet? Because it is one of the most difficult things to do, particularly in the context of the industrialized food environment, where these foods that are deliberately designed to interact with the reward systems of the brain are everywhere. They're heavily marketed. They're very cheap. They are ubiquitous, they are socially normalized. So how do you change individual behavior when you're trying to push up against that? That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, I had this um, uh, question on, on the uh, possibility to uh, document benefits of lifestyle uh, changes. It seemed complicated, but what you are saying on the type of trials that are best adapted uh, is, is really uh, interesting. Now concerning the SMILES uh, diet, you highlighted that it's cost saving when compared to uh, the baseline uh, transformed food diet. So I do understand this in terms of uh, medical economics, as you illustrated, but for food, this is not the perception we have uh, I say in France and maybe in Europe, uh, it mm. seems to be a better food is higher cost. And so uh, do you have any clue about that as to why it should be so? And uh, is organic food in an importance in your mind? No, no, not at all. And, uh -huh. you know, for, for white, middle and upper class people with high health literacy and access to, to resources, we will go and buy fresh fish or uh, organic vegetables or this sort of thing that actually you don't need to do that to eat very well. And um, legumes are a really good case in point. So lentils and chickpeas and all the different sorts of beans, these are dried, these are tinned. They are the basis of a very healthy diet and they are very, very cheap, inexpensive. Frozen vegetables are fabulous. They're nutritionally equivalent, if not superior. You get less wastage and they're far easier to prepare and are available. Tinned fish, you do not need fresh fish. Tinned fish is fine. So there are some things that will be more expensive, but you eat less of. So nuts, for example, almonds and cashews and walnuts and these sorts of things, they are more expensive, but you eat fewer of them. So there's that sort of a thing where it all depends on how you do it as to whether it's expensive or not. Okay. Let me open the floor to other colleagues. And I would say we have Marion in, in France, so let's hope that uh, she gets followed by hundreds of people like you are and uh, we get moving things in France as well. Marion, <laughs> you wanted to uh, raise your hand. Yes, thank you, uh, Felicia. It was really great. And thank you very, very much for your, all your energy and for sharing with us all your results. Uh, given the fact that we have lots of clinicians uh, listening to your uh, lecture just now, if you had some advice to give them on what they should prescribe or explain to their patients uh, in terms of diet, what would you say? This is my first question. And do you have any recommendations depending on the mental disorder? Is it different for a depressive episode, for bipolar or for schizophrenia, for example? Yeah, really, really great um, questions. First of all, I'm just, oh, this is annoying. I was just going to quickly open up uh, another one of the presentations that is really focused on translation 
and gives this is from the one of the the, the person in our team so we have many dietitians in our team um, and they uh, translate the evidence and help practitioners to understand how to put this into practice um, so what I might do is just very very quickly because it's much easier to do this is just share my screen again and um, here Sweet. we come back to this uh, the Royal Australian New Zealand College and you see these these recommendations here and we've written quite a bit about this within the the guidelines there are some simple tips about you know, fruits and vegetables, these sorts of things. Um, and there are obviously clinical dietitians that you can refer to. Um, but the other issue is, of course, comorbidity. We know that there's a 20 year mortality gap between people with and without mental disorders. And this is largely due to medical comorbidities. So there's another very good reason for addressing diet. But uh, sorry, I'm just flicking through to the, the key ones. Uh, if you're wanting to help people to change their diet, these are the sorts of very simple things you can ask. What do you normally eat? What would you have for, for dinner, for breakfast, for lunch? How would you describe your food habits? Do you think that they're healthy? What foods do you like? What do you not like? What does healthy food look like to you? How many fruits and vegetables do you have a day? Do you have a special diet? I think one of the key things that we note that's very concerning is that, you know, medical practitioners have virtually no training in nutrition and yet a very high proportion of them are giving them dietary advice to their patients. And very often it's the wrong advice because it's things like ketogenic diets and, and carnivore diets and things like this, which is going way beyond the evidence or is con directly contradicting the evidence. When it comes to the microbiome, the same principles are true as are for diet quality generally. And we know that the microbiome is incredibly complicated. And Joelle, you will <laughs> reinforce this, the biome yes. of the, math, the maths is incredibly complex. But what we need to eat for a healthy microbiome seems pretty consistently clear and simple. And that is lots of plant foods. People don't have to be vegetarian or vegan, just lots of plant foods. And here we're not just talking fruits and vegetables. We're talking whole grain cereals, so brown rice and barley and oats, for example. We're talking legumes. These are really important sources of fiber. Um, so chickpeas and lentils and different types of beans. We're talking nuts and seeds. We're talking herbs and spices, as well as vegetables and uh, the whole grains that I mentioned. So lots of plant foods, diversity of plant foods the more diverse your plant food intake the more diverse your microbiota and this seems to be a healthier microbiota reduce or eliminate ultra processed foods and we think that having some fermented foods is probably beneficial although the evidence is yet too early to say that for sure so they're the principles lots of plant foods diversity of plant foods avoid ultra processed foods and have some fermented foods and they're things like yogurt kimchi sauerkraut these sorts of things kefir so they're very simple principles and when we look at the data from right across the world there's no one type of healthy diet there's you know healthy norwegian diets or japanese diets or french diets or you know chinese diets they all have at their basis a higher intake of these plant foods and whole foods so meat yes but unprocessed meat um, fish and then lower intakes of these ultra processed foods. And these are consistently associated with better mental health. Whether there are specific diets for specific conditions is a completely unanswered question. Now there are various um, hypotheses around mitochondria and bipolar disorder and glucose metabolism and schizophrenia that makes us want to test um, a healthy version of a ketogenic diet in these disorders. And here we're not talking about an Atkins diet, which is all saturated fat and animal foods. We're talking about diets that are still very high in plant foods and fish and olive oil, but they, are, um, they achieve ketosis. Now we're trying to run and have again affected by COVID, but a pilot study of um, this form of a healthy ketogenic diet in people with schizophrenia that we're doing in Finland. 
and we're just starting the work to do something like this in bipolar disorder. But it should be said that the evidence for this is completely lacking. Ketogenic diets can be really dangerous. Um, like I'm talking serious medical events. They have to be very strictly um, overseen by a dietitian. Um, and they are not diets to just be randomly suggesting that people adopt because they are often very, very low fiber diets, which is of course the worst thing you can do for your microbiota. So you need to be doing it very carefully. So at this stage, the principles and all of the evidence says a diet that is a Mediterranean style, meaning it's high in plant foods, high in olive oils, healthy forms of fat um, and low in junk and processed foods is the one to adapt, but it can be, you know, in line with whatever the cultural preferences are. Thank you very much. That was very clear and useful. Uh, I suspect people are not asking questions because of the Ang English maybe. So if you want to write a French question in the chat, I'm sure Joel and myself, we can easily translate it. Yeah, you'll stop us, Marion. I can spend many more time, many more minutes asking questions. So I'll, I'll address one right now. And people can also raise their hands with the, uh, with the tool. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, FMT in depression. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the other side of the spectrum, I guess, when we, uh, we've been talking nutrition. What place do you see for FMT in the uh, domain of uh, mental disorders? If, if planned as an add-on in, in depression or uh, you anticipate the need to manage uh, drug-bug interactions in this context where it can be a bit uh, complicated? Mm, good question. No idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it really, it's just so early. I mean we just don't know really what the impact will be. And this is why we have to do these initial studies. We've, we've really got no idea. Okay. And we don't know things like the dose. How often do you have to administer this? Does it need to come along with a special diet? Yep. Like, do you need to pre-treat with antibiotics or with a bowel preparation first? All of these things, we have no idea. We're just so early on in, the, in this that we, we really don't know. But I mean, it's certainly true, Joel, that the people, a, a person's microbiome seems to be very important how they process medications. Medications interact with the microbiome. I mean, every medication does. The differential effects on the microbiome of different types of medication is another completely unexplored area. I mean, the fact that antibiotics, like a broad spectrum antibiotic, in general, the fact that antibiotics have been so overused in clinics and also in the food chain is enormously problematic. And many people think that this is the reason or at least a good part of the reason why we have an obesity epidemic globally and an epidemic of um, allergic and autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. because we're knocking out people's microbiome at the start of life when it's their immune system is developing. None of this has been proven yet. It's all speculative. But then you have other particular cases such as minocycline, which is an antibiotic, but it seems to have antidepressant properties. Mm. So it may not be as general as all antibiotics are bad. They may be targeted ones. They may be targeting particular pathogenic bacteria, but the, the field is so young and it's just so complex that I mean, I think we'll be, we'll be looking at this for the next hundred years. Okay, I still don't see any hands raised over the 80 people attending. Um, so I'll have one more question. Uh, I like the way you differentiate direct uh, impact and indirect impact, but that was more uh, diet to, uh, to the uh, newborn or the infant. Um, I, I would like to challenge a vision I have uh, among indirect uh, triggers, uh, I, I envision that the microbiome will play with permeability, gut permeability, that is, will play mm -hmm. with inflammation, will play with oxidative stress. And I saw that these are among the, uh, indeed, the triggers that you're addressing in terms of mechanistics. Um, would you have a, a vision of what could be the uh, priority one in terms of a potential uh, alternative or combinatorial target with the microbiome among permeability, inflammation, oxidative stress, for example? Hmm. Good question. Uh, it, it relates also to the fact that we see that there are many um, 
or a high prevalence of gut symptoms in, in many of the mental disorders. And so for me, that comes together, basically. Absolutely. And I think that there's just so much to unpack. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going off to do this course in two weeks in Venice with John Cryan is convening this microbiota and the brain neuroscience advanced course. And I will come back and I'll be able to answer this question probably <laughs> far better. But I think it, it's, it's really unknown. And I mean, when we think about just, for example, these uh, very demonstrated relationships between diet and brain plasticity, we see this over and over again in the animals uh, via impacts on BDNF and um, neurogenesis. Yeah, okay. And then we see in humans these relationships between diet quality and brain uh, hippocampal volume. But we don't know, is that direct? Is it indirect via the microbiome? How is this working? How, I mean, the immune system is the obvious first port of call when we think okay. about you know, the microbiome and whether that's um, due to the, the inflammatory, um, what's going on in the gut and the impact on gut permeability, that's one thing, but it may also be working through different pathways, mm -hmm. through metabolic pathways and things. Well, I don't think, well, I certainly don't know as yet. I might find out in this course um, that more is known than what I know. Uh, but at this stage, I don't think we know. And it may differ for each person, you know. I see uh, Gassen is uh, willing to ask a question. Can you and then maybe your microphone? Can, uh, yes. To stop after that question. Yeah, it will be the just, last one. Uh, very quickly. Hello, I'm just a, a psychiatry resident in Albert Chenvier. Just wanted to know if there, if we have new insights on the effects of bariatric surgery on severe mental disorders. And thank you. Ah, that's really interesting. It's it's so confounded because of the psychological impact of weight loss. Um, what we do know, as far as I know, the last time I looked at the literature is that bariatric surgery has a very, very immediate impact on the microbiome and a very positive impact on the microbiome that seems to be not driven by weight loss because it happens before weight is lost. So that's fascinating. How does that happen? It's the same with bariatric surgery. It seems to really address uh, type 2 diabetes before there's even been weight loss. So I think, again, this is really complex stuff we're talking about here that we don't really understand how the whole digestive tract and the brain talk to each other is just so complicated. But uh, I think bariatric surgery can really help people okay. from a psychological perspective. If it improves the microbiome, there's every chance that it may also improve psychiatric outcomes for that reason. But I don't know that that's been looked at yet. Thank you. Thank you. I'll leave the last word to Marion. Please, go ahead. Okay, no, well, I can only thank you very, very much for all these uh, informations you, uh, you shared with us, including uh, some non-published work on the uh, impact of, uh, of the diet on Shannon diversity and uh, specific taxa in the, uh, in the infant. So that, that's already fascinating uh, upcoming information. So thank you, thank you very, very much, uh, Felice, for all that. Thank you. It's a great joy, and I will hopefully see Marion and maybe Joël later on this year in and in, in Vienna, and maybe also in Paris, which would be great. Yeah, cool. Great pleasure. Thank you very much, and congratulations with all the hard work. Thank you so much, Marion. Thank you, and I'll, yeah. I'll I hope you have a good day. Sleep Bye, well. everyone. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.